Well, our, our next session's a panel discussion, and uh, we're going to have take a minute or so to get uh, get chairs set up. The uh, the crew's going to come out here and do that do that shortly. Um, the uh, the director has been asking me to to vamp as this is happening, which sounded kind of obscene to me. I guess it means in show business, stretch things out and and kill and kill, kill time. Yeah, this. Uh, with a, a panel of our part of the community would, would, would make sense. They bring a different perspective kind of at the in, implementation level for a lot of our customers. So that they're, they're a perfect group to, uh, to do that. Um, and they're coming from, from all over the world. Now that, we're, now that we're set here, I'm just gonna introduce them in a second here. Uh, coming out first is gonna be James Bratzos from Checkmarks One, who's gonna fill the first chair. He's joining us in a second here, he's on his way. And uh, right after James is Antonio Mosalim from M3 Corp. Uh, Gabriel Catropa from uh, IBM. And, uh, and Claudia Cornali Mota is gonna be uh, moderating this panel. So Claudia's gonna come out and take us through the, uh, the questions and more introductions. So Claudia, come on up. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Really excited to present uh, this panel discussion on deciphering the DevSecOps toolkit. I want to give each of our panelists a moment to introduce themselves and the companies they work for before we dive right into those questions. So James, can I start with you over there? <clears throat> Hello, my name is James Bratzis. I am the head of product management at Checkmarks. We do application security testing. Um, you've heard a lot about shifting left. That's pretty much our motto. Hi, my name is Antonio Mosellin. I'm a CRO from M3 Corp, a 15 years old distributor, cyber site distributor there in Brazil, and I have a very strong vertical of DevSecOps. All right. Hi, everyone. I, I'm Gabriel Cadralpa. <coughs> I run uh, cloud security and a Gen AI for security for Americas and IBM. Glad to meet you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Okay, so. Uh, Let's launch into our first question. Uh, in terms of the maturity of your customers who are approaching you for DevSecOps, what is their understanding of Dev DevSecOps and are they very specific in what it is that they're looking for or do, are they really relying on you to guide them? Yeah, so I think uh, most customers or clients that approach us are looking for a real partnership with us, right? So. They're either approaching us as totally green, they have no application security program in place, or they're trying to replace their current vendor because it's not working out right now. So we see a lot of customers who, you know, they want to start with making sure their developers are being enabled, um, either through training or th through some stack analysis. So you see, you see customers all, all across the board, either completely imma immature, where they never had anything in place, um, they've had some kind of incident that happened, uh, or they just need to, you know, mature, and uh, you get then you get customers who have been all the way at the other end who want to advance their program even more. So, yeah. And additionally, we we are trying every day to, to convince the customer that it's very important to make this movement from DevOps to DevSecOps. And we had a, a new report from from CrowdStrike saying that 80 of 10, that biggest data breach that they have in in 2023 was through application. So this is a new bacon that you have in, in dark hand. So this is something that you need to show them that's very important to, to make this movement. So, so uh, uh, to, to complement that, I guess the, uh, so we are see, we're seeing the market, the, the part from application security, especially the cloud security, uh, a, pretty, a pretty complicated uh, environment to, to get safety inside it. Uh, one of them is that uh, uh, cloud misconfiguration application security just become the uh, the fourth most attack vector exploited. So, and in, 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 in the last uh, IBM Trident Intel Index report, so that explains uh, and answers if the uh, the sec DevOps and SDLC and application security is is really uh, taken seriously by by all of the developers and, uh, and the cloud migration uh, uh, possible projects that we are seeing. Uh, it, it only, it, it gets worse than, than that side and, uh, and the number of vulnerabilities are not helping as well. So that's, 
that's a very complex word to, to handle it for today. And it needs to double down the attention on that. That's what you're seeing in the market today. Yeah. All right, and let's go a little bit deeper into that because you all have almost touched on it. Is there a single event or milestone that really kickstarts this DevSecOps journeys for some of these companies? I think that the digital transformation for every single business was the, the most important item that you have in, in, in this movement, not only to, to adopt DevSecOps, but to make the DevOps as well, as you said, in the previous presenta presentation that say that we have DevOps, we need to make this more, ad, uh, more on agile. And the, the, this concern about cyber security in general uh, was accelerated by this digital transformation. We have our business there, our money, our transaction, our customer, our data, so everything is there. Yeah, like in more legacy type of deliveries, you'd see all the testing being done at the very end of the cycle. So bringing it into the very beginning, and not getting burned at the very end and be able to plan it from the beginning and seeing different vulnerabilities is also is very helpful. Yeah, on the, uh, on the side from the biggest uh, events that we saw in the last year uh, and, and IBM clients were the instance that we, we, we helped them to fix was mostly was originated by, the, by some sort of a, oh, incident especially a data breach. We're seeing less exposure on, on we're saying that uh, uh, exploitability inside of uh, uh, hacking force specifically, but we are seeing more login information, login information. So there is a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is a more than 8 billion username and passwords breach it. So that's mean it, it's more passwords and usernames than, than humans, right? Uh, so we are seeing that that's everybody's going to the easy way and they are, are getting worse once, once they're inside, they're trying to, to make a movement on it to help them to exploit even more. And that's where at the application security, it goes in definitely and try to stop that depart from, from the breach. It just, the breaches just have become worse than that. So we are seeing a, a lot of those events for across any industry. All right, thank you all very much. Now I've got a question specifically for you, James, around check marks and uh, this, this language you're using around shift everywhere. And I think you, all, like, you touched on that briefly in your answer. Um, can you expand on what that means, to, not only to check marks, but also to your customers when they're successfully <clears throat> shifting everywhere? Yeah, to be fair, I think Gardner or Forrester marketed that term, shift everywhere. But I think Ed presented it, but also the, uh, the presenter before me with that, you know, the infinity symbol, right? So you see a lot of companies starting off at that coding stage uh, where you can implement static analysis and software composition analysis. But really you want kind of shift everywhere mentality where you are doing security throughout the whole software development life cycle. Um, two examples I can think of, you know, especially what you guys are promoting here by security by design is, you know, having the threat modeling being done in the design phase of the software development lifecycle, um, but also at the build stage. So we see a lot of vulnerabilities being done during, you know, infrastructure as code, right? So anyway, you're deploying your Kubernetes, uh, we're seeing a lot of incidents inside there. Um, and also, you know, you can think about like typical legacy tools such as DAST during that build and test stage as well. So it's not just good enough to do it during that coding stage, but also throughout the whole kind of infinity life cycle. Yeah. Uh, if, if, I can, no, if I can add on that, it's a, well, depart from developers, the, there are concepts that uh, are bringing automation to, to the SDLC elements and uh, CI CD pipeline and everything that we're seeing, secure by design approach. Uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, one from from Gardner as uh, a risk framework call it, uh, and apart from CNAP approach uh, from cloud native application protection as well. So that's is also trying to take trying to take care of a, a sense of design to post implementation as well. At the same time that they teach how to code uh, uh, even better or even in the safest way. That that's what means. And and I from the first part I, I get a, the concept over DevOps really. DevOps was when security is embedded, it's inside of the, uh, the cycle from the, the security approach for every product, every single product that you do. It's just like, like manufacturing cars. There's a seat belt is there, the airbags are there, the brakes are there. So that's the kind of a mentality and that's, you have to, you know, to turn that into a muscle memory into the organization. So that's gonna be part of that 
for every single uh, uh, factory uh, development apart from the codes. And there are some technologies that can help you to do that as well. Yeah. And just to complement as well, mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, today we have a lot of implementations of security gates. So it's not, we don't have exactly one point. We have a lot of different points that we need to explore and to add those security gates. So if I can do this by design at the first time, not only the shift left, but the shift left of the shift left that you can do with security by design, for example. And we can add this in our pipeline and in, in building different stages in the cloud. So any security gate could help us to increase our protection at, at all. Mm -hmm. So we don't have only one point to do that. We need to do as maximum as possible to, aggr to, to give us the, the level of maturity that you are looking for. I think that's a fantastic point. We don't want that single point of failure, right? And let's talk a little bit more about that. You know, the secure software development lifecycle is really large. And there are so many high value leverage points that we could use to safely build products. Can you share in your experience, whether it's individually, like within your own company or with some of your customers, what those high value points are? Sure. Yeah. Today we have some customers that at the beginning they start to to follow some technologies and tools just to, to to follow the rule. I do you have AST solution? Yes, I have it. Doesn't matter the result, doesn't matter the impact that I have in my company. And today we start to see companies that is um, is growing the number of tools to protect different parts as Cloud said Matt Gabriel. And we also have those tools starting to be checked if it's, they are giving us the, the value that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to, to have a solution to make a SaaS, DAS, SCA. I need to get the, the real value that I'm looking for. So can I reduce my surface of attack with my SCA solution? Can I reduce the time to fix that I that I need to bring to my dev team. So right now we need to judge better the tools that I have inside the company. And those companies that start to, to implement something, they already have this, this way of thinking. So this is, is very good in, in my opinion because we have more maturity inside the market. And some customers start to see DevSecOps as a unique item, not DevOps and Sec or Sec or Sec in somewhere. This is, is very important. Yeah, I think you've, really see, you've also seen a real transition from it being just a checkbox, from the application security team just running tools, to now developers actually consuming those and actually fixing these results. So it's really important to identify some of these vulnerable projects and the business risks to your organization as soon as possible and have the developers actually fix it. So you know, really identifying which, which ones are important to you um, and manageable as well, because you don't want to completely overload your developers, of course, right? So identifying the highest risk applications and the highest vulnerabilities inside those applications. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as an example, I see uh, like a financial industry, big banks trying to, there, there's a puzzle between legacy systems and, 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 and next generation banks, right? So that's completely like a more live version, more virtual, more uh, cloud type of application native approach. That we've seen that, it, it's working well, but there's a, there's a challenge between uh, this communication back with the legacy systems, where we're seeing there's a huge amount of effort uh, trying to mess it up with that part from the legacy system, then try to turn that into a safety approach using SEC DevOps approach and those elements. And that's quite challenging, that's quite challenging. That's, that's a very difficult situation when you see that journey happening. And we see, uh, especially the, 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 the banking industry, they are trying to uh, move it out to a full digitalization approach, like a multi-channel, omni-channel solutions that we are talking about uh, being uh, 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 more for the end, end user client and more available to mobile banking and everything else that we're seeing in the market, but that it's it's very complex situation where you have to protect those security elements and those applications inside of of the legacy communication between the department environment. So uh, it, the challenge is uh, you, you can protect both of them. You have to, to be like a risk-based approach. 
you can protect anything, every, everything on the base on the infrastructure level. So you have to, to take a stand related in what's the risk level of those operations and those applications between communications and everything that's surrounding that and how you're gonna to plan to do that, especially for that because otherwise that could be too costly first and uh, completely inappropriate for any kind of budget or, or any kind of uh, uh, management perspective level, right? All right, some really, really great points here. I wanted to ask, you know, coming back to this risk-based approach, uh, what are the criteria that companies should be taking into account? Right, we're now expanding further than just the tool itself. We're thinking about how we can set it up for success within our company. So, what can we do to make sure that? Uh, what do we need to be considering when we're choosing a new tool? Right, what stakeholders should be involved, or do we need to take an even further step back and be looking at the organization as a whole? What do you recommend for customers when they're evaluating new tools? Uh, so I can answer that first. So I, I would say that the, the risk approach is it's valid approach because you can start segmenting exactly where, where you're going to start uh, based on on the risk for 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 the business risk, and then you lower down that to IT IT risk specifically, and then you're going to tackle that from uh, uh, enterprise risk perspective. So that's that's one. And uh, but how? Uh, the, the tooling perspective and the technologies that you're going to put that it needs to communicate uh, uh, back to back with the front part from the bringing value to the business at the same time that's getting easy more easy handling on a part from IT perspective and how are they going to be handling that so it needs to be a, a like a workflow process between the whole IT organization the whole developers organization and uh, and so on and so forth at the same time that you can bring in, up get out the information from the tool from the risk perspective, otherwise you are, you're losing uh, you're losing that telemetry and how you're going to bring value to the board of directors, the CEO level, CFO, and so on and so far. Right. Yeah, and I think that risk is, is very important. As you said, we have high risk flaws that we need to focus our effort to, to figure out this as, as, mass, as fast as possible. But I, we also have the cost at the end. This is a big key in my opinion as well. So if you have sometimes some flaws that spend, today we have an average time to figure out a flaw of 12 hours. So it's a lot of time. Imagine we have all our DevSecOps team involved to figure out a problem for so long time. It's very expensive as well. We know that we have a risk, we need to figure out those problems, but how can I reduce the number of flaws that I insert in my code? Not only my, my, my first code, my, my third party code as well. So we, we need to, to understand better what's the risk at the end that you have from different sources. So you said about Synap and we also have ASPM. So it's a new approach from, the, from Gartner saying that we need to, to use application security posture management to understand the different sources that I have. I have check marks telling me that I need to do this first. I have my cloud solution telling that I need to do this first and a lot of, a lot of different sources saying, I'm the first, I'm the first. Who, which one is the first in the, in, at the end mm -hmm. that I have more risk and high cost involved? So those points is very important to take care when I make my, my decision about the tool. Yeah, so I have two answers to this question actually. So <clears throat> I would say when you're evaluating a tool, <clears throat> pick the tool your developers like. Um, and I'm not just talking about, hey, a developer went to a, some GitHub conference and they saw some kind of presentation. But if you don't have your developers involved in this process, they're the ones who have to deal with this. If they don't have the buy-in, they're not going to have the buy-in later. And they want to be a part of this process. So having the developers help you choose a solution is going to go a long way. The second advice I have is, I've, I've been a part of this in a very large shoe company, um, was having like a vendor day. Have a bunch of vendors come in. It could be through your partners or your channel or whatever it might be. And have them pitch your, all these ideas and pitch their products so you have a really clear idea what people are offering and the differences between them. Um, that really will help you do that selection. And once you've made that selection, continually, continue this vendor day approach where once a quarter, once a year or half a year, you're, you keep on evaluating, you're giving them feedback, you're trying to see if there's areas they can consolidate perhaps. Um, but these would be my advice is when you kind of go through evaluation of tools. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and those items is interesting because 
considering that you have a lot of different new developers all the time changing, changing, mm -hmm. this awareness is very, very important to maintain inside the company. This, how can I maintain everyone in the same page, right? I myself have never participated in a vendor day, but I would love to. It sounds like a really fun version of a bake-off. <laughs> um, you all are touching on stakeholders. And I want to come back to how we can promote a culture of security, one that extends far beyond the DevSecOps teams, but also into our various stakeholders, like the engineering organization. What can companies do to make sure that developers are not only empowered, but they're also on side when you're bringing in a new tool? I love the security by design approach. Um, and now I've been thinking, you know, thinking it from a product perspective is, you know, it should be, it's typically the application security engineers are working with engineering directly. But why not the product team as well? The product team are the ones who are writing these requirements. They're the ones who are involved. They're the ones that are going to approve any kind of feature or anything that's coming in. Work with the product team and have these security features built in. And we have it built in from the very beginning. They're going to identify things like open source packages that they might need to bring in or APIs that they might be using. And they can make sure that from the very beginning, their mindset's already thinking about security. So you've already enabled them halfway there by letting them know about it. And then you know, through training or through you know, static tools, verifying these requirements, you can really build on top of that. So I do, I do love that approach of having it in the very beginning when you do the design, then they're not surprised at the very end, right? Yeah, and, and bring this, this subject as, as soon as possible. Uh, with uh, Secret by Design, uh, making everyone understood that how important it is to add security on their software. And because they already understood that software is the company. The company is, is, is maintained by software. So why, why security is important? We need to show the, the right methods to each one. So when I have a conversation with C-Level, we need to, to show them what is the, the, the value that they have to add security. Today, the consumer, they are aware about that as well. So I don't want to use as a tool or a bank that don't, don't have the, the right level of security that I'm looking for. So this impact my decision at the end. So we need to show everyone, but the training could be a, uh, just to answer the question, to, the training could be a, 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 a good vector to start this awareness inside the company, mm -hmm. but changing the message not only like an e-learn training that I just clicked yes or no for some questions. Mm -hmm. I need to, to, to show why at the end. Yeah. Uh, just one, one, one example from what we do in, in, in IBM. It's uh, uh, many projects works with, uh, with a part from squad type build, right? So we have the squad with the developer, with the part the stack officer, the engineer, the architect. And we try to put what we call it a secure champion inside of those squads. Uh, I was working in a very complex, uh, was a trading platform for a bank in the US. And uh, if you think about it, we had a more than 1,000 people working on it, more than 90 to 100 squads. So it's quite, it's quite challenging. You have first one security person or one security champion that doing the role of being promoted, being the secure awareness training leader, and to every type of squad to make sure that they're going to follow the SLC process and the, all the, the, the elements of security since the beginning. So, but we try to do that to build that part from muscle memory to turn that into an embedded program, to embed a security services program since the beginning. Uh, we are seeing also that uh, the market for cybersecurity, it, it's missing a lot those secure developers codes, at least skews with a part of that. And uh, we are partnering, for example, with uh, universities, trying to get uh, this brand of new people that are coming uh, to, the, to the market, specifically with the part from skills into security functions, into security development, because uh, that's going to be pretty important uh, uh, in the, into the near future. It's, it's been important right now, and it's mm -hmm. going to be even more important in, in, in the near future so far. Do you have any examples of how companies have been able to successfully start a security champions program, um, just seeding that idea within the engineering organization, or does it require a higher level of buy-in from other stakeholders? You can see it, multi I've seen it work be successful in multiple ways. Um, 
first of all, I think you know, it's an added bonus for an engineer. It's a way of getting something on their resume. It's something that they can use to promote themselves within the organization. Uh, it's, and then they can use it actually to bump themselves into a different career if they want to go in from engineering to um, into security. But I do believe it needs to start from the top. And when I say the top, I would say you know the VP of engineering probably needs to be involved to promote this type of uh, behavior. And then in, and it's a matter of making sure they're trained. It's making sure that they are um, that they are enabled. Um, and one great technique I've seen is like a you know, it was like a dessert day or something like that, or a cookie day or whatever it was. And like, basically every security champion had their own little meeting and they were able to get out, give out cookies and stuff like that and they just talk about security. So anything that can get people together really will help. But, um, you know, I, I'm not fully aboard with a cha security champion model. Every organization should have a security champion in place because that's the only way you're gonna scale out. Yeah, actually, when you see a security champion inside the uh, squads and their SLC in general, we can see that it's easier to maintain because imagine how fast is today DevOps in general and how fast will be in a few years. So it's very fast to have a new release every single day, every single minute, maybe sometimes. Some customers have this, this speed of development. So we need to have somebody inside this squad that maintains security in the right level. Understood that what, which kind of uh, problems or flaws that I need to buy the risk because today sometimes uh, if you make a decision by a dev, a dev guy maybe could be a wrong decision because he doesn't know exactly how how it works how security works so what is, could be the impact he understood a lot about the, the, the development the, the language and everything else but we need to understand the impact about the business so this guy could be our, our voice inside this squad. So that's, that's a, a good point. And, and we saw much, much better result when you have a secret champion inside this squad that in comparison with those ones that don't have it. Mm -hmm. So, and we still have a high number of flaws that is, in, in, is included inside the software. Yeah. So if you remember that you have about 7% of the software with flaws, is it's very high. How can I reduce? So I need to put something, more security gates, more gates inside the, the, the squad to bring this, this no knowledge to, to those guys. And, uh, I think that the, the part from the risk-based risk, risk -based approach per application, it's, it's key to communication with the stakeholders, mm -hmm. especially with the, with the board level, with the C-level, because uh, again, it, it there's an old mantra talking about, and say the, the SDLC, uh, it, it costs less at the beginning, and it's going to cost you like a two times more uh, in the end if you try to fix something uh, when it goes to production. And that's true, but uh, that element, it's, it's kind of like uh, hard to prove because it needs to get down to the business front. Every application, it, it has its own risk and its own importance to the business. And they are completely uh, different from impact perspective. If, if you have it on a high impact application that's tied to what we call the BIA, uh, the business impact analysis from the company, and that's its key for them, oh, that's, that's probably, you're gonna get the sponsorship from everyone to, to, to produce with a more effort than in those, in those kinds of, uh, of development. But if you don't, or if the development, it's, it's moving out to other areas or to the other regions that with less impact for the company or for the business, and then that's gonna be pretty hard for you to, to get that, that, that message from, or the sponsorship from the board level, from the C-level. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all so much for expanding on that. We have this concept in product uh, where the PM brings the donuts. So I feel like you know our security people can definitely step that up. Our security champions can be bringing some cookies not only to <laughs> engineers but also perhaps to their exec and, and C-suite uh, members to try and convince them that security is something we should be implementing in each squad, if you will. All right, uh, we'll do one or two more questions before we move on to Q&A. Are there common investments that you see people making in terms of DevSecOps tools? I'm really interested to hear, you know, what type of tooling, perhaps you can't say the names, but what type of tooling you see people investing in when they're first starting on the journey versus when they mature? 
uh, I, I saw the, f the first thing, in my opinion, is AST in general, SAS, DAS, and NetCA. Mm -hmm. Because imagine if you have your code, a lot, hundred or thousand of the, the developers working, and you have no idea what's happened there. What kind of flaws that you have inside your code? So first of all, I, we need to understand what's the size of my problem? What kind of problem that I have in my code? And when I start to have this with SAS, DAS, and SCA, I start to see my problem, what I need to, to, to touch to figure out those problems. But the second, the second step, uh, I truly believe in threat modeling because we can see a lot of problems with SAS, DAS, and NetCA, but all, if I make this movement to the right, I just increase my cost. Mm -hmm. So I need to find a way to reduce my cost of in injection of flaws inside my code. And this threat modeling could be a, a very nice key to reduce the number of flaws that I, that I will find in my security gate from my SAS, DAS, and SCA. And this impacted my dev team as well, because if I need to do twice a code is terrible as a developer. So if I have a, a suggestion better at the beginning from my product manager, say, do, you, do, you, do the code like this. This I have the right code to do without problem. So this helps us a lot, in my opinion. Yeah, without doubt, you start off with SAS and SEA. Um, you, you can't really verify your requirements from your, from your design phase or the, secure, the security by design if you can't verify those requirements. So SEA and SAS, without doubt. I think the two ones after that that I'm seeing the most is secret detection. Um, and also uh, container scanning. So these are the two ones I'm seeing, um, you know, kind of in the market right now. Uh, I see, uh, would all, all, I definitely agree with that, with all of, uh, but I would add on, a, on top of that, uh, pen tests specifically for, for application. That's, it's gonna give you uh, the, I, I understand the tools and technology and I, 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 I they bring a lot of value, but also there's the mentality from an attacker that it needs to be exploited. Uh, also to give you the, the sensitivity of, over the reality, especially uh, with the possible uh, real flaws that's gonna be uh, coming from a, a, an attacker. And I guess that's, that's, that's important for us to, to, to separate that from the, what, what's the commodity exploitation and what's the real threat actor, what's it, we are talking about the kind of like a nation state threat actor, Raveni, we are talking about what kind of uh, a possible exploits. And I, I will just add on top of that, apart from the pen testing, pen testing companies, whatever, uh, doing that just to complement the reality, the sense of reality as a triple check uh, to get more safe on, on those. All right. So for organizations who are just starting out on their DevSecOps journey, what advice do you have for them for getting started and making sure that they're getting their security culture started on the right foot? I think the key is automation to making sure it's part of your pipeline of some sort. So it's inside your CI, CD pipeline. Um, and then I would say the second is making sure that these results are being put into the developer's ecosystem in some way. Either they're able to review it in the IDE, either it's being decorated in their pull request, or it's in their bug system. Or in their bug system. I think if you can get developers to treat security vulnerabilities like bugs, it's a complete win for everybody. So these are the these are what I would aim for to just start off with. Um, yeah, and and we we saw companies that just started um, this this kind of integration mm -hmm. that you have with. Uh, the tools that I will add in my SDLC, this integration is very important because uh, we need to make this fast as, as necessary to do. And the second point, need to be transparent as possible to the, the dev team as well. If I change their lives, oh, I, I just start at the company, I need to start to, to work in a different way, doing the same job. So we need to maintain exactly the same place. I will do my job in my IDA, I will use Jira or Azure DevOps to make my job. I will put the information right there. As simple as possible to my dev team uh, is better to add security as in like a transparent check inside my SDLC. That's, is the, I think that's the most important item that you need to, to, 
to suggest a new company that start to make this DevSecOps process. And to other companies that you have um, those tools for a long time, today those items is a problem because they have a lot of um, softwares that are still there and it's very hard to change. The ecosystem is very complex. So if you don't do this in the right way at the beginning, it could be a big problem to you in the future. I'll, I definitely agree with, the, especially with the part from automation. Automation is key and it's coming really to stay. Uh, there's a concept called uh, AI ops, which is it's definitely where we're seeing mostly from the infrastructure moving out to uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, operational uh, at the infrastructure and the application level, and that's that's key for success. Definitely, you 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 carry on on that part from the automation inside of that concept model. Uh, zero companies are there at this point. That's that's really really future state. Uh, but but that means that uh, it needs to get started now in order to succeed. That in a five to to ten years journey. It's how you embedded uh, security coding into uh, full automation or mostly using robotics, using uh, extracting as much as you can on the automation purposes to be to build really to, to build really the, the, the DevOps journey with security embedded into that. One more recommendation I have actually and going back to your kind of your pen testing suggestion is that when you do roll these type of tools out and you know developers are seeing this for the first time, you're trying to enable, you're trying to train, I really recommend showing these vulnerabilities in their own code. You don't want to show them something that's coming from, you know, open source projects such as WebGo or something like that. You want to show them something that really is to their heart. And if you show them a pen test, you can show them the exploitability and what would have happened in their own code that really lights the fire underneath the developers. I truly believe developers want to embrace security. They want to write secure code. They just need to be pushed in the right direction to show the value of it. Um, and that's why these tools are so valuable, is showing them their exploitabilities. And I think that comes right back to Ed's earlier point around engineers feeling that sense of responsibility that perhaps a physicist wouldn't. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to ask if we had any questions in the audience here before we move to some online Q&A. Okay, I'll start online first and I'll give you all a moment to get your ideas together. Um, so one of our questions is, what kind of toolkit would you like to see in various SDLC phases considering modern architecture practices? What kind of tool? Yeah, what kind of toolkit? So I think they're, they're asking for multiple tools. Okay, yeah, actually we, it's not possible to have just one solution to cover everything because that you have this conception of ASPM. Uh, but I think that we need to, to do threat modeling, for sure, no doubt about that, because uh, we need to reduce the problems, and we need to remember, as Daniel presentations here, that we have AI against us, not only to help, but to, to attack as well. So they are using AI to make this process, so we need to reduce the number of flaws that you include there. Uh, SAS, DAS, and SCA, um, especially as SAS and SCA, today we saw some case that they, oh, I will start just with SAS. No, no, doesn't matter if your code or third-party code, it's still your code. Imagine if you're a, a car, um, car company. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you retire from you or from Goodyear, it's your car at the end. So we need to protect with both. And we also need to do this synap. And we, do, we cannot um, stop to, to mention that we have APIs at the end, talking to the world and with my database as well. So this is, is a, another layer of protection that we need to touch. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very important, in my opinion, uh, with in, in this journey at the beginning and at the end with the API protection. I'll disagree with you a little bit on that one. I, I do see, and you mentioned ASPM, I do, I do see that you want to find a solution that can cover all of that, including the application side and including the cloud side. So if, they, if the company doesn't perhaps do the cloud side, at least they integrate with a company that does on, the, on that side. 
So I really do think you want to find a tool or a solution that does cover all of these solutions throughout the whole life cycle. Um, you know, doing SaaS infrastructure's code and DAS, and then tying in the, the CNAS. And one of the reasons I do think it's important is because you can start doing a couple different things. One is that tool can then start correlating some of these results together. And with correlation, you can start reducing some of the noise. And with ASPM, really the, the, the key to ASPM is developers can't fix everything. We have to identify what is the riskiest applications and the riskiest vulnerabilities inside those applications. And tools that provide, like ASPM tools that do have that, can then help you during that journey because then your, your, your developers are fixing the most important vulnerabilities inside their applications um, and they have a full context of that whole software development lifecycle. Yeah, I think CNAP, the part of it, is definitely a good one. Uh, secrets management, threat modeling. I would just add on, 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 on that, uh, the micro-segmentation. So micro-segmentation, it's, it's definitely a concept that it can help probably, uh, let's say, if you, if you fail and uh, any one of those tabs, basically, it's going <laughs> to cover your <laughs> definitely. Reduce the impact. Yeah, it's, it's going to help you to to any kind of uh, possible exploitation, letter movement, or anything else relates to that. I know that's pretty hard to implement it, but uh, it gets you good telemetry. It's the, the, the sense of uh, micro-segmentation approach, and you can start small and then growing up uh, that for other angles and, and so on and so far. So it's, I guess it's, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go back to James's point about risk, right, and prioritizing, because we can't solve for everything. Someone has asked how we prioritize risk, and more importantly, how you can communicate it without causing friction between your stakeholders. Yeah, so one thing that we do actually is that we can actually look at, with integrations through Wiz and Amazon, we can actually take a look at, or AWS, I should say, we should actually take a look at how your services and endpoints and containers are all set up in its topology, network topology. You can identify the projects that are considering internet facing or public facing. And we can take those services and actually tie it to the code repositories that the developers are working on. So then with this type of information, you can be like, okay, I'm gonna prioritize vulnerabilities inside this project because I know it's internet facing or has an API being exposed. So I think that can be used to calculate the risk score. Um, also, it has to do with your business context. You can identify some applications that are considered to be more of a financial risk to your company and use those as a higher prioritization. Um, and then correlation, as I mentioned before. So correlate, if you find results in multiple engines, you can start bubbling that up because you're gonna have more confidence in those scores. Yeah, and when, it, when you bring this concept of a ASPM and it starts to make this correlation, correlation in different tools that I have inside my SDLC, uh, I start to, to see that I have not only one point to figure out the problem. Sometimes I, have, I can do a micro segmentation, I can do a, a firewall rule, actually, you can, it could be possible. So when I have this, this context in my hand, it's much, much easier to decide where I can figure out the problem with the lower impact in my cost, in my time. As I said, we have 12 hours to figure out a, a code flaw. Mm -hmm. So if I have a, an option to make this in, inside my container, it could be faster than that. So this, uh, I think that is uh, the base of this, the ESPM that is, is the top of wave in, in Gartner Wave today in the DevSecOps. So it's very important. I, I would say that I look for Look for the KPI from the company. Look for the KPIs, executive KPIs from the company first. If, if any of those applications are tied to a KPI from the business, that's an important application. And that's gonna give you uh, definitely what you need uh, to get any business justification for, for investment into a SCLC program or anything related to, to that part from the, those elements. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a risk approach based on to board of directors. That's how they are thinking now today. So if we understand about what the, the KPI from the company, you're gonna have the executive KPIs and the IT KPIs that support that, you can easily see the connections between if that application, it's a key element or not for, for, for the business. And if, uh, if the answer is yes, uh, you definitely can, can get a business case to support that at a quite, quite easily on. All right, and that's a great segue into our next question. We're talking now about accountability, right? 
and back to the business, who really is owning or should be owning the DevSecOps toolkit? Is it IT, security, operations? Um, what is the best practice that you've seen working with customers when it comes to ownership? I see. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Definitely not IT. I don't think, I don't think they're ever gonna be wanna be involved. And in, in, even not even DevOps to a certain percent, to a certain sense, where they're just worried about putting something in the pipeline and, and, and throwing it out the door. Mm -hmm. It really has to come through development and the application security team, really. Yeah, I, I, I saw a lot of CISOs as the guy that managed the, the, the main idea, mm -hmm. but we, we cannot forget that we have the DevSecOps is one word, not different words. Uh, and we need to make this integration uh, more deep as possible because uh, as we said be before, we need to maintain the message from the beginning at the end in all stages of my application. It's not possible to do this like a pen test at the end or just, I will do just threat modeling, that's enough. Um, so, but we saw a, a lot of different companies with some, sometimes with the wrong guy taking care of that, with, sometimes without uh, the right knowledge to make this happen. But um, the, the cyber team uh, to, to promote the, the guidance, I think that's the, the answer. I guess, uh, I, I, as the name of the conference, the security by design. So we understand that that should be by design, embedded by design for the whole process. It's the same from, from the analogy over the, the manufacturing a car. We, it's not the security area that, that puts on the seatbelt on the car, on the brakes on the car. It's the engineers that you know, at manufacturing that, that place of the portion. So we, uh, th that, and it's a journey. We, we, know, we all know that it's a journey. So starting from, from outside, and uh, uh, if you take the, again the analogy over the car, you're gonna see there was an accident that probably someone just got killed and, and so on. So you're gonna be able to depart from the brakes, so you're gonna enhance those tanks. And, and, and that's, that's the journey so far. But at the end of the journey, it, it's, it's really that it should be embedded. It should be by design, the concept. Whatever journey you're thinking on it, for if it's on the shift or left or shifting or right, at the journey, it's the, the end of the journey. It's, it's really to get the concept by design, using champions, using uh, uh, secure harnesses, campaigns, using as many tools as you can, with as many automations as well. I think that's a fantastic point to end on, making sure that security by design is embedded in your journey. Whether you're just starting out for DevSecOps or you've already reached the, the midway point, there's always more that we can be doing to make sure that we're putting out secure products and that it's an entire company's responsibility. I want to say a big thank you to all of you for coming in and participating. And yeah, thank you all. I agree. You're welcome.